There you go, Paxos. All right. So uh, that an official that. stable coin. Official. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, uh, Daimler, that Daim I'm not kidding you, right? Daimler? Daimler, yeah. Daimler from uh, Stuttgart, Germany. Pop culture has shaped and formed the public perception of a technology that theoretically exists since the mid-50s, artificial intelligence. In short, AI. However, the term AI is often misunderstood and used incorrectly. AI is not some personified voice over the air that answers arbitrary questions, some omniscient intelligence that knows everything. So, what is AI then? The answer is quite simple. AI provides methods and tools, like a Swiss Army knife, to assist and automate tasks for which typically human intelligence is required. Artificial intelligence made its breakthrough with performance and statistical learning on large data sets. Deep learning is pushing the technology further and further to learn complex patterns and provide predictions. AI technologies thus enable applications for future cars and car development processes. Automated driving can use AI methods to detect objects in the environments, such as vehicles, streets, and road signs, in order to plan a maneuver. For several years now, Mercedes-Benz cars already use similar technology to detect and classify pedestrians as such. Inside the car, systems like the Mercedes-Benz User Experience, MBUX, provide recommendations and predict user preferences. But not only customers benefit from enhanced in-car functionalities, development and manufacturing of vehicles are also supported by AI-powered tools. When engineers analyze test data from cars during the development phase, AI methods identify anomalies and assist them in finding issues at an early stage. Machine learning algorithms are able to find patterns in vector fields of air circulation in combustion engines. In doing so, machine learning helps to increase the maturity ramp up during development. Reducing development time is also achieved by self-calibrating systems, for example, for a modern transmission. Deep reinforcement learning can be applied to infer feasible calibrations in a software-in-the-loop environment in early development stages. At Mercedes, colleagues from AI research, IT, business units, and external partners collaborate together to explore and implement the possibilities of AI applications for the future. Right? That's correct. Oh, okay. I just, no, I'm just making sure, you know? You look, okay. like, you look like a teacher over there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm messing with them, guys. Uh, so Mercedes-Benz. The, the, the German auto giant overseen a number of blockchain pilots, <clears throat> uh, ranging from letting uh, Daimler truck owners make payments for fuel using e-euros to issuing a one-year 100 German debt instrument known as a... Uh, Schlussendaschen. <laughs> <laughs> Pronounce it. Go, go for it. Go for it. I believe it's Schulschein. <laughs> okay. Schlussendaschen <laughs> is also using blockchain uh, technology to track contracts along the supply chain <laughs> through subsidiary, a subsidiary Mercedes Benz. So their, Benz. their blockchain is Hyperledger, Corda, and Ethereum.
You got anything to say about that? Can you pronounce that word for me one more time? The Schulstein. Schulstein. All right, so go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Next, we have the beers. Diamonds uh, from London, England. The end of blood diamonds? Question mark. The beer's new software tracer follows diamonds which have undergone 3D scans as the gems are mined, cut, polished, and sold. Already more than 30 participants, including Sinye Jewelers, owner of K Zales and Jared, have signed on. Tens of thousands of stones are being registered per month. Their blockchain connection is directly to Ethereum. One, well, wait, wait, one, one thing. Uh, is it, it's sig, sig, what did you say? Cause it's, is it signet? Signet jewelry? You probably say that. I say signe. Okay. Cause yeah, that sounds so fancy. It was so classy. I was like, signe. <laughs> <laughs> I read it. Like, Tell me, signet? <laughs> <laughs> this is where the class is. Class, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so depository trust and, uh, Clearing Corporation, DT. The DTCC. It's kind of a hot item on Twitter the past few weeks. Every day, trillions of dollars from around the world pulse through the global markets. Transactions are cleared and settled. Money and securities electronically transferred between parties. And all of it takes place seamlessly, securely, through a sophisticated infrastructure. Connecting this global marketplace, DTCC. Founded in the 1970s to address the ever-increasing volume of paperwork that was overwhelming Wall Street, 
DTCC has a proud history of solving the great operational challenges of the times. Standardizing, centralizing, automating back and middle office processes, creating market efficiencies that reduce costs, providing steady leadership in times of uncertainty. We have set the standard for post-trade processing. User-owned and governed, DTCC drives solutions that serve the needs of clients around the world. From initial onboarding, through trading, clearance, settlement, asset servicing, and data reporting. Every year, DTCC processes tens of billions of financial transactions. From serving as the centralized clearinghouse for the U.S. capital markets, to operating the world's first and only global trade repository for the derivatives market. With offices in 15 countries, multiple operating and data centers globally, a state-of-the-art business continuity program to assure seamless execution during times of crisis, DTCC is uniquely positioned to meet the challenges of an ever-evolving marketplace. As changes in market structure and new regulations transform the industry, DTCC is leveraging its expertise in new markets around the world. Proactively engaging with clients and the industry, providing innovative solutions to address the top challenges while supporting future market growth. As the backbone of the financial markets, DTCC has a unique vantage point to anticipate needs and drive positive change. We are securing today's marketplace and shaping the future of the global financial industry. We are DTCC. DTCC. Right. New York City. New York. So Global Securities, uh, Global Securities Warehouse, DTCC, will soon move its 10 trillion credit <laughs> derivatives <laughs> of business to a blockchain. These derivatives represent some 50,000 accounts held by some of the largest financial institutions in the world. Previously, each institution would keep its own record requiring continuous uh, reconciliations and uh, redundant efforts. DTCC's new shared ledger will eliminate waste of and paper work. So paper and work together. Are you writing something good, sir? Yeah, I was trying to check. I th was wondering why. I know you and I discussed Axcore. Axcore. Yeah, I, I even, I have, I mean, I had the link up, but I kind of took it off because I thought you didn't even want to get touch base into it. But um, you could, I can actually look it up and pass it to you in a link. Just give me one second. I know that. I, I know there the, is. I think I sent you the link. Uh, earlier, let me see if I have it here. I know there's a link, uh, some kind of a connection with Axcore and Ripple. And I know there's some kind of a link with Axcore and Ethereum, but I'm not sure why we did not. Axoni, they, they connected to Axoni, no? Was it? I, I, honestly, I'm probably blanking. I'm not sure why it's not uh, listed uh, up here. I know we opened it. It might've got closed by accident. Uh, that's okay. It's okay because uh, write that down. I know that they're connected. Don't worry, I'll get back to it. We still yeah, got, we'll, we'll put it in there. We'll, still got like thirty nine more to go. Right. <laughs> yeah, we still have a lot to go. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. I know we pulled it up, and I'm totally blanking because I I kind of relied on the tab. Um, on, I, I do know that there was some kind of a connection with Axon, uh, Axon um, and Ripple, and there was one also to Ethereum though. Axoni. Uh, is building the smart contract with DLT on Axcore's blockchain protocol. R3, um, WIC, Ack as a solution advisor. So I guess there's a connection directly back to Ripple with that because that's R3. Uh, yeah, uh, I, it was what I told you, Ax, uh, Axoni. They're connected with Axoni, and Axoni is a blockchain, uh, blockchain networks, uh, distributed applications, which is connected to uh, the Ethereum. So... In the long run. Okay, but, so overall you're finding it Ethereum also? Well, I mean, from what I'm reading right now, I'll, I'll dig in uh, deeper, but that's what it seems like. Yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm kind of finding the same thing too, that it was going back to, um, the two I'm finding was uh, connecting back to Ripple and, and 
um, in Ethereum. But again, it, the, the bigger focus of Axe Core was um, that I'm finding is Ethereum too. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll pull that one up and you can put it in the, in the description or whatever. I don't cool. want to focus too much on that right now. Not sure what happened that because I know you and I discussed it and we opened it. I know, I know. What's going on with us right now? Are we having a hard time? Oh, no problem. No problem. Projects, company, company. Let me just read a little bit. I'll, Let's go. I'll go into the next one while we're doing I'll okay. give you a chance to check, see if you can find something quickly. Uh, the Dull Foods from Charlotte, North Carolina. Dole Food Company is the world's largest grower of fresh fruit and fresh vegetables. A leader in nutrition education, the Dole name represents high quality and good health. Dole is a top provider of bananas, pineapple, packaged fruit products, packaged salads, and fresh vegetables. With more than 200 products, Dole is feeding the world with the foods needed to live longer, healthier lives. Founded in Hawaii in 1851, Dole built its reputation on its commitment to quality and quality and quality. For 160 years, it's remained the company's bedrock principle. Dole made the name Hawaiian almost synonymous with pineapple. Considered an exotic fruit, the pineapple is an international symbol of hospitality and is now produced by Dole throughout the world alongside its wide variety of other tropical fruits and vegetables. Dole Food Company's worldwide team of farmers, packers, processors, and shippers is committed to consistently providing the most nutritious, high-quality fruit and vegetables while protecting the environment in which its products are grown and processed. And our dedication to food safety encompasses stringent quality control measures, state-of-the-art tracking and transportation technologies, continuous improvement through research and innovation, cutting-edge crop protection programs, and dedication to the safety of our workers, communities, and the environment. Dole owns an unparalleled array of tangible assets encompassing tens of thousands of acres of farms and other land, including over 20,000 acres on the island of Oahu, Hawaii. The company has the largest dedicated refrigerated containerized fleet in the world which includes almost 15,000 refrigerated containers and over 20 owned and chartered vessels to move product around the globe. Dole also owns over 60 ripening and distribution centers in Europe and Asia and over 1 million square feet of vegetable processing facilities globally. Additionally, the company's packaged food business processes its product lines in almost 2 million square feet of owned manufacturing facilities. Our distribution centers from Japan to Europe ensure that finished Dole products reach consumers fresh, ripe, and on time around the world. In addition to such tangible assets, Dole's most important resource is its team of 75,000 educated and highly trained employees. Our farms and facilities can be found around the world, from North and South America to Europe, Africa, and Asia. From forming cooperatives with small farmers in underdeveloped countries around the world, to bringing technology and economies of scale to individual farmers, Dole pursues successful, long-term investments that benefit consumers, growers, and the communities in which we operate. Dole's long-term success is rooted in being a good custodian of the land we farm every day. Yet our sustainability efforts extend beyond the field. In addition to bringing jobs to local communities, Dole also builds roads, ports, schools, hospitals, clinics, housing, sports facilities, and water purification systems. Dole's strict environmental policies follow good agricultural practices integrated crop management and integrated pest management programs which help both the planet and the consumer. These efforts are supported by an extensive research department dedicated to studying tropical agriculture. The company is continually investigating and implementing sustainable, environmentally healthy and safe ways to improve production methods through technological advances. The proof of our success is visible throughout the world, where Dole's sustainable farming techniques have allowed us to cultivate the same land with record productivity for over 100 years. Dole Chairman David H. Murdoch established the Dole Nutrition Institute to educate the public about emerging science on the benefits of proper nutrition. 
These resources include the recently published Dole Nutrition Handbook, an award-winning newsletter enjoyed by 2.5 million subscribers, plus videos, brochures, cookbooks, and more. In addition, Dole has been an industry leader in children's nutrition education for nearly 20 years. More recently, Dole has established the North Carolina-based Dole Research Lab to investigate the potential of fruit and vegetables to promote health and prevent disease. From its worldwide multicultural team of associates that produce the freshest and healthiest fruit, vegetables, and packaged fruit from around the globe, Dole is truly the great taste of nutrition. Uh, pause. Uh, they're connected to Fran uh, Franklin. Where, where did I read that? Franklin uh, Templeton Investments. The OX coin. OX. And the OX is connected Zero to X. base. Zero coin X. Base. Yeah, I call it the OX coin. <laughs> but yeah, it, they're all connected. Then you have the uh, HSBC, uh, JP Morgan. Oh, and, there you go. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. okay. So JP Morgan, yeah. their main yeah, focus so it's is Ethereum, Quorum. OX, it's, it's more okay. mainly of it an investment. The investments. Okay. Are. That makes sense. That's okay. That's what it was. I do remember now. Axcore kind of interactive with both like uh, Ripple and a roundabout and, and uh, Ethereum and a roundabout. Correct. Okay. That's what it was. Um, Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right. We're going into the Dole Foods, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. After several high profile recalls last decade, Dole has adopted blockchain across all vegetable processing for millions of pounds of lettuce, spinach, and coleslaw. Customers at Walmart can now check where their fruit comes from by scanning a code used by farmers. Dole's fruit business is next. Dole's new level of traceability starts on the farm and ends at the grocery aisle. Current transaction volumes through partner IBM Food Trust are about 11,300 transactions a day or 2.3 million a year. And they kind of tell you right there and right into the blockchain connection, we have IBM blockchain. We have, last time I looked, we have some 32 uh, public references for blockchain. About two thirds of those are in the finance industry. About one third of them are outside finance. Um, these are a se selected few on here. Again, the, uh, the, the uh, connections community is the place to go if you want to find out Hall 32. I think you'd be impressed by the breadth of selection of the different nations, the different industries, the different um, use cases that are rendered on block blockchain. So that's well worth a visit to put some details behind this very high level view. And Hyperledger Fabric. We know that's dedicated to Stellar, and their coin would be XLM. For instance. Where, where is your lechuga from? Can you trace it back real quick? <laughs> sure, buddy. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's how complex they want to make it now. Like, where did this piece of lettuce come from? But honestly, they'll be able to on the blockchain. It's Stop amazing. It. Stop it. <laughs> we still got a lot to go, okay? <laughs> So are Facebook. we halfway there? Are we getting close to halfway we're, point? We're by, we're by Facebook. We've all heard of Facebook. It's huge. It's so big that if it were a country, it would be the third largest population in the world. So it's no surprise that with over 500 million active users, Facebook is the most widely used social network on the planet. Facebook is all about relationships. No matter how big or small you are, you'll be able to reach your customers and get to know them better. Facebook lets you have an instant dialogue with your customers. Tell them what you're doing, find out what they think about you, and get ideas about what you can do more of to make them happy. Getting started is easier than you think, and Constant Contact is here to help. <laughs> yeah, I made that classy. I like it. I'm, I'm learning, it's contagious, all right. So, uh, Menlo Park, California. Last June, Facebook boldly announced its plans for Libra, a cryptocurrency backed by a basket of stable assets, including the U.S. dollar and government bonds. The announcement brought Facebook haters out of the woodworks who were low uh, to CD, to CD uh, monetary control to the same company uh, whose... La uh, laissez-faire. 
laissez faire. Laissez faire, yeah. So, sounds so much nicer coming out of your mouth. All right. Approach <laughs> to its technology <laughs> may have contributed to the unexpected outcome of 2016's presidential elections. Already, many uh, original Libra uh, backers, including Visa and MasterCard, have, dro have dropped out of Facebook's um, consortium. Stay tuned, however. The Libra Association that administers, yeah, that administers the blockchain uh, code says it will launch the cryptocurrency in 2020 if it can get regulatory approval, which they will, through, and where do they work on? The hot stuff. Blockchain, hot stuff. We did keep the hot stuff. <laughs> Most blockchains work as a decentralized digital ledger, which is maintained by a distributed network of computers. Such a technology allowed the creation of trustless economic systems where borderless financial transactions could be executed without the need for intermediaries. Since traditional banking and payment systems are heavily dependent on trust, cryptocurrencies are now being adopted as a viable alternative because they rely on blockchain technology and are used within trustless systems. The participants of a cryptocurrency network need to regularly agree on the current state of the blockchain, and that is what we call consensus achievement. However, reaching consensus on distributed systems in a safe and efficient way is far from being an easy task. So, how can a distributed network of computer nodes agree on a decision if some of the nodes are likely to fail or act dishonestly? This is the fundamental question of the Byzantine General's problem, which gave birth to the concept of Byzantine Fault Tolerance, sometimes referred to as BFT. The Byzantine General's problem was conceived in 1982 as a logical dilemma that illustrates how a group of generals may have communication problems when trying to agree on their next move. Imagine that each general has its own army, and each group is situated in different locations around the target city. The generals need to agree on either attacking or retreating. It doesn't matter whether they attack or retreat, as long as they all agree on a common decision. So, we may consider the following requirements. Each general has to decide and vote on either attacking or retreating. After the vote is made, it cannot be changed. All generals have to agree on the same decision and execute it in coordination. However, they are only able to communicate through messages, and the central challenge of the Byzantine general's problem is that the messages can get somehow delayed, destroyed, or lost. Even if a message is successfully delivered, one or more generals may choose, for whatever reason, to send a fraudulent message to confuse others, leading to a total failure. If we apply the dilemma to blockchains, each general represents a network node and they need to reach consensus on the current state of the system. This means that the majority of participants within a distributed network have to agree and execute the same action in order to avoid failures. What is Byzantine Fault Tolerance? Byzantine fault tolerance is the property of a system that is able to resist the class of failures derived from the Byzantine general's problem. In other words, a Byzantine fault tolerance system is able to continue operating even if some of the nodes fail to communicate or act maliciously. There are multiple ways of building a Byzantine fault tolerant blockchain, which are related to the different types of consensus algorithms. We can define a consensus algorithm as the mechanism through which a blockchain network reach consensus. The algorithm used by Bitcoin is called proof-of-work and is one of the most common implementations. While the Bitcoin protocol defines the rules, the consensus algorithm determines how these rules will be followed, for instance, during the validation of transactions. The concept of proof-of-work is older than cryptocurrencies, but Satoshi Nakamoto developed a modified version that enabled the creation of Bitcoin as a Byzantine fault-tolerant system. Although proof-of-work is not 100% tolerant to faults, it has proven to be one of the most secure implementations for blockchain networks and is considered by many as one of the most genius solutions to the Byzantine faults. Securing these systems is an ongoing effort, and the existing consensus algorithms are yet to overcome a few limitations. But the potential applications are certainly inspiring widespread innovation. Beyond the blockchain industry, a few use cases of Byzantine fault-tolerant systems include the aviation, space, and nuclear power industries. To learn more about cryptocurrencies and the technologies behind them, don't forget to watch our other videos at Binance Academy. Yeah, exactly. And this is directly...
we'll go up so you just you can see the title and you don't even have to take my word you can just read it yourself fast and secure global payments with stellar boom so you're directly on the stellar pdf on their paper file here and i think i think for the most part i think a lot of people well no i think we i think we found that out when we dug did i pass it because a stronghold and all that and Oh, I passed it. There was a good little section I want to read. Look for it. We have time. It launched right past it. I'm not sure why it went to the end. We're having a couple little challenges, but that's okay. Not bad. That's all right. That's what happens when you get new computers and new screens. Oh, by the way, guys, <laughs> oh, wait, I'm not even at home. I'm in a, a hotel, so I got to manage with what I have. It's called working the game. Yeah, dedication right there, man. Dedication. I'm home. I even, I even showed up early I, I did all the work early so i would be here early <laughs> so <laughs> all right where did this thing go here and it was around the third page let's just see take your time take your time all right let me try one more time oh there it is i don't know why i chose to skip it the first time um other efforts to adapt byzantine agreement protocols to blockchain like settings including honey badger SBFT and hot stuff. So we know that the Byzantine agreement, that was a major thing for the Stellar Protocol. The Honey Badger? The Honey <laughs> Badger. <laughs> that one's actually interesting. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's actually a funny, really funny video on Honey Badgers, but we'll get into that another day. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead and read uh, uh, Figure, uh, which is in San Francisco, California. Uh-huh. Okay. I gotta go. Hey, I'm Blockchain, what's up? You've either heard of me and you don't know what I do, or you've never heard of me and you don't know what I do. Or you know all about me, in which case, I don't know how you're here. Go watch a cat video or something. For the rest of you, here's what I do. First off, I'm not Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, or anything scary. Ah! Woof to you too. In fact, I make things less scary. I improve financial transactions like loans, behind the scenes, to make them more efficient, secure, and less costly. Which, if I work my magic right, can save you money. I'm what companies like Figure use to record, share, and exchange the data about your loan. Before me, this was all done manually, aka by people. And people can make mistakes. And then other people have to find those mistakes and correct them, which all takes time and money. So how does Figure do it differently? They use me to create an immutable record, meaning it can't be changed. So the administrators, trustees, and other people who used to verify all that paperwork can have more free time to pursue their scrapbooking dreams. So whenever you use Figure to get a loan, I make a block. Hey, Carol. Seth. That block is a super secure digital record of the transaction. In fact, it's so secure, in order for me to create or append a block, I have to share my block with a network of unbiased computers called nodes from trusted financial institutions all over the country. Yo! Hi! Oh, hey there! Howdy! And they all have to sign off on it to give me the go-ahead to make it. Good to go? Go, go for, for it. it! Which means I can always maintain the security and legitimacy, or truth state. I'm like a vault, except a super secure vault with many different keys that gives you a big, long, undisputed chain of truth, or paper trail, but without all the paper. So with Figure, we can pass that time and savings on to you. So you can get out of this place and on to a better place. Like literally anywhere but here. Later! Save yourself! Figure, powered by blockchain. That's me! Nice, where all the fun is. Uh, Figure San Francisco, the unicorn has facilitated more than 800 million USD in home equity loans, mortgage and student loan refinancing for lenders, including Caliber Home Loans. Franklin Templeton is among the financial service firms that manage nodes to validate transactions on its Provenance blockchain platform. All documents are stored and algorithmically verified on the blockchain, right down to the Hyperledger fabric. Is there a blockchain connection back to Stellar? Oh, all right. Do you know off the top of your head, I'm blanking. Unicorn is what, a company that does 1 billion annual sales? Yeah. 
Okay, that's what I was thinking. One billion. Unicorns. So these are massive. No, you know, unicorn is actually a white horse that has a uh, magical powers, and you only see it uh, every once in a while. It actually flies. That's you know, have you ever seen the movie Legend? It's an old. I think it's eighties. Uh, maybe I I got I can't remember right now. When I think of unicorn, I think of that movie. I think it's called <laughs> Legend or something. It was like Tom Cruise or, or something. It was really old. I was a little kid, you know. <laughs> We're getting silly. We're getting silly. Let's keep it moving. All right, so we got Foxconn. Oh, which Terry Guo Taiming was ranked Taiwan's richest man in 2018, with a net worth estimated to be 7.4 billion U.S. dollars. Guo owns Foxconn, best known as the maker of Apple's iPhones. The company started in 1974, making plastic parts for TV sets. But under Guo's leadership, has grown into the world's biggest contract electronics manufacturer. Foxconn has factories and subsidiaries in Taiwan, Japan, Southeast Asia, the U.S., Europe, and mainland China, where it is the country's single biggest employer, with 1.3 million people on its payroll. Besides Apple, clients include Nintendo, Sony, and Dell. Which is in Taipei, right? Taipei, yeah. <laughs> Taiwan. <laughs> and then it go, uh, <laughs> the iPhone maker, uh, the iPhone makers trade uh, finance venture, chained finance, pay more than 20 uh, electronic suppliers using digital coin minted on the Ethereum blockchain. The result uh, uh, financing costs have plummeted from annual percentages from percentage rates uh, as high as 24% to 10% and the time needed to get funding has been cut uh, from seven days to the same day. Foxconn uses Ethereum's blockchain, famous for innovating so-called smart contracts, which automate financial transactions, and it's built on the Ethereum. That one got a little, like, twisty. Yeah, and that one, they were, like, man, they wanted it confidently known it was on Ethereum. <laughs> I think it said it multiple it times throughout the yeah. description. <laughs> <laughs> like it's gonna, we're going to get beer. Just gonna in there. <laughs> now, this is uh, something I've, <clears throat> I'm excited to discuss, General Electric. And the reason why, I'll get to the end. General Electric. This is the story of General Electric, a story about legendary inventor Thomas Edison, jet engines, and unrivaled power. A story that Facebook and Google might do well to study. So let's go back to the beginning. More than a century ago, in the early 1870s, Thomas Edison began working with his father to build a small lab in rural Menlo Park in New Jersey. It took several years, a loan, and a ton of hard work, but when it finally opened in 1876, it became the world's first research and development facility. A year later, Edison had his first major invention, the phonograph. The first words Edison successfully recorded on the phonograph Apparently, he said, Mary had a little lamb. Word of Edison's phonograph quickly spread across the world, and people flocked to witness the marvel, with many referring to Edison as the Wizard of Menlo Park. But the wizard wasn't finished just yet. The following year in 1878, Edison made another groundbreaking discovery. He created a bamboo filament that would allow a newly invented technology called the light bulb to now last for days instead of minutes. However, around the same time, a rival called the Thompson Houston Company was also emerging. Thompson Houston was beginning to threaten Edison's business, making competitive versions of similar products quickly and well. Competition intensified in early 1890, but after two years, both businesses decided to stand down. Financier JP Morgan, who controlled the bulk of Edison's company, made the decision to fuse the two. And by combining them, he effectively created what we know today as General Electric. In 1896, GE became a founding member of the Dow. And in the following years, GE strengthened its grip on the consumer appliance market, 
For many employees, it was a golden age. The company made quantum strides with products like Edison light bulbs that lit up millions of homes. It manufactured electric locomotives that fueled America's railroad industry. And it also helped advance medicine with x-ray machines that allowed doctors for the very first time to look inside the human body. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, GE began to win numerous Nobel Prizes. One discovery helped build the world's first full-body MRI machine. Another allowed GE to take the first images of blood vessels ever. GE consistently worked hard to stay ahead of its competition, hiring a number of Nobel Prize-winning scientists over the years to help the company continually innovate. By the 1970s, GE CEO and chairman Reginald Jones began to push the company into international markets. In 1981, GE had a new CEO, Jack Welch. Welch was different. GE began to aggressively hire elite corporate talent and ruthlessly cull underperforming employees. While other conglomerates were seen as sprawling and opaque, GE was seen as a role model able to survive downturn after downturn across various industries. Under Welch's leadership, GE went from roughly $27 billion in revenue to nearly five times of that, reaching $130 billion when Welch left. Fortune magazine dubbed Welch the manager of the century. However, industry watchers were beginning to notice the unusual changes in GE's accounting books. Instead of using generally accepted accounting principles, the company began using techniques that were opaque, frustrating market analysts. Fortunately, the insider frustrations didn't reach the wider market. Under Welch's reign, investors remained oblivious, bullish on the company's prospects. And in 2001, they cheered as the mantle passed to his successor, Jeff Immelt. The company was now worth nearly $600 billion, but dark clouds were looming. Four days after new CEO Jeff Immelt took over, September 11 happened. The World Trade Center was insured by GE Capital, which hurt their insurance business, and demand for air travel also began to dampen, which hurt their plane leasing business. Soon after, GE started hemorrhaging losses. Everything was going wrong. Immelt, pushed to act, began to pursue costly acquisitions. On top of 9-11, Immelt had also bought security companies for undisclosed amounts. He also bought at least nine businesses in the oil and gas industry. He even bought Enron's wind turbine business. But the stock price continued to slide. An infection was spreading, and Immelt seemed oblivious to it all. By the time the financial crisis hit, GE almost died. So why did Immelt continue to acquire companies while the stock price was sliding? Immelt and the board were making bets of blind optimism on companies that they believed GE could convert to profits. Under Immelt's reign, GE Capital had become a big profit generator for the company. It was taking bigger risks, notably in commercial real estate. So when the housing market crisis hit, the real estate industry took a colossal blow and the GE Capital segment crumbled forcing it to take a bailout from Warren Buffett, who gave GE $3 billion to stop the bleeding. And soon thereafter, GE was forced to take another $139 billion loan from the federal government. Now, GE had to cut its own dividend for the first time since the Great Depression. This is important because many GE retirees and shareholders who had long relied on GE's consistent payouts had now lost a stable source of income. By the time Immel stepped down in August 2017, the organization was an overburdened mess. Costly acquisitions began to weigh on the behemoth, and eventually, GE stock fell to a third of what it was in 1999. So where is GE now? In its current state, despite being the world's largest manufacturer of jet engines and powering a third of the world's electricity, the stock only trades in the single digits. The company retains its core businesses like aviation, power, and has divested itself of many of its former verticals and products. And while CEO Larry Kulp tries his best to right the giant flailing ship around by selling off parts of the company, market watchers look on with skepticism. To quote Ashwas Damodaran, a finance professor at New York University, GE brought electricity to Americans, appliances to kitchens. It's left its imprint. It's accomplished much of what it set out to accomplish. But GE is going to be the last of the 100-year breed. The companies of this century have no chance of lasting 100 years. Technology is a very harsh taskmaster. Boston, Massachusetts Why? <laughs> is actively exploring blockchain through its 30 billion USD revenues, aviation, 
subsidiary, which was built or has built what it calls a back to birth record of an airplane engine that records important details of the manufacturing process and specifics about maintenance performed. In an industry where complete, easily accessible records are critical to productivity, airline parts without proper documentation are not easily bought and sold. GE's blockchain team has created a digitized paper trail in order to prevent engines with incomplete paperwork from sitting unused. The blockchain connection here is the Microsoft Azure, the Corda, the Quorum, and the Hyperledger. The thing, uh, you know, did we get into? Yes. We did get into it. Well. We got into it. We got into it because uh, you were, well, we wanted to kind of put together something that really stands out when it comes to Stellar um, and, rep and okay. my, my Microsoft within itself. Microsoft within itself is working with uh, both through IBM. Okay, that's right. And the, um, the thing that I was excited was Corda is obviously the, R3 Corda is the XRP, the Quorum is the Ethereum. And the Hyperledger comes back to the XLM, uh, the Stellar. And I just did that video. I'm not sure if, you know, whether you've seen it or the audience has seen it yet on our channel where these three connected back to the CBDCs. So I'm finding these three connected, as we've done in the show tonight, everywhere financially, including CBDCs, as we just did a video. World adoption. Massive. Coming soon to the theater near you. Absolutely. XRP, XLM, and Ethereum, they're just going to be massive. This, this, is, just a, if, this is just a clue. Ready? Well, yeah, exactly. Hold on, ready? Ready? <laughs> All right, let's go. Keep going. <laughs> I can see it, but it was very silent. I could hear it. But I mean, those three, you know, whether it excites you or frustrates you, to me, it excites me because it shows those three have found a system that they know that they can dominate working together. And okay. then what's coming out in the news, you just saw Ripple is now partnering up with Ethereum. Microsoft Azure is a private and public cloud platform. You may be familiar with the Azure services that developers and IT professionals use to build, deploy, and manage applications. But how does it work? Azure uses a technology known as virtualization. Virtualization separates the tight coupling between a computer's CPU and its operating system using an abstraction layer called a hypervisor. The hypervisor emulates all the functions of a real computer and its CPU in a virtual machine. It can run multiple virtual machines at the same time, and each virtual machine can run any compatible operating system, such as Windows or Linux. Azure takes this virtualization technology and repeats it on a massive scale in Microsoft data centers throughout the world. Each data center has many racks filled with servers. Each server includes a hypervisor to run multiple virtual machines. A network switch provides connectivity to the servers. One server in each rack runs a special piece of software called a fabric controller. Each fabric controller is connected to another special piece of software known as the orchestrator. The orchestrator is responsible for managing everything that happens in Azure including responding to user requests. Users make requests using the orchestrator's web API. The web API can be called by many tools, including the user interface of the Azure portal. When a user makes a request to create a virtual machine, the orchestrator packages everything that's needed, picks the best server rack, then sends the package and request to the fabric controller. Once the fabric controller has created the virtual machine, the user can connect to it. Azure makes it easy for developers and IT professionals to be agile when they build, deploy, and manage their applications and services. But this agility can have unintended consequences if unauthorized resources are created or if resources are left running after they're no longer needed. The solution to this problem is to use Azure's resource access management tools as part of your organization's governance program. That's the subject of the next video in the series. IMF Managing Director Christine Lagarde says the global economy is in a very fragile state. She made the comments during a conversation with Yahoo Finance's Miles Edlin, and he joins us once again from DC. So, Miles, what other topics did you touch on today? 
Yeah, you know, outside of the headlines that we've gone through a few different times here at Yahoo Finance, we also extended our conversation and talked about a couple of interesting areas. I think Brian Chung might like one of these, and it's digital currencies that central banks might issue. We also talked about regulating some of the biggest tech companies in the world. Take a listen. It's, it's actually happening. Uh, when you look at the Caribbean islands mm -hmm. and the, uh, the Caribbean uh, central banks uh, and the Bahamas, actually, uh, you have, I believe, four or five islands mm -hmm. which together have decided at central bank level to go with a, di a digital currency. So central bank digital currency mm -hmm. is coming alive. Uh, it's, it's not going to happen today. I think they have a 12-month experimental mm -hmm. period that they want to, uh, to go through before they actually uh, launch for good. And how much at the IMF are you thinking about the next 70 years of the global economy, specifically on issues um, like climate change, which you mentioned mm -hmm. today as an overhang on where this, this whole project might be headed? Well, I think, you know, some of those global issues like climate change, like uh, corruption, um, are issues of general interests, mm -hmm. and particularly for young people. So while we've served uh, the international community for 75 years, we need to look at what is going to interest and motivate those who will be 75 years uh, in 75 yeah. years. So looking at young people, what is of, con of, of concern to them is, in my view, really important. Mm -hmm. um, we do not want to venture in areas that we have no competence in. But clearly, the fiscal impact mm -hmm. of climate change related policies is critically important. You're talking about, you know, $5.2 trillion, which is huge. It's right. almost 6% of global GDP. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at those numbers. This is our, this is our business. This is what we are uh, mandated to do, to see where the revenues come from, where the spending is, whether the fiscal position is, is in a good place and provides a good equilibrium. So climate change is vitally important. Corruption yeah. uh, is also extremely important. And the research that we will be releasing in a few, in a few days mm -hmm. demonstrates very clearly uh, that corruption is a break on growth. Corruption is a break on employment. Corruption deteriorates mm. confidence. I mean, you talked about the, the winners take most um, economy. Dynamic, and, and, yeah. yeah, and it's sort of a, an interesting thing because most conventional measures have said things have gotten better, right? It's not all bad, um, but it does feel like these companies are contributing to an increasing amount of economic inequality. And so is there a role for a more international organization like the IMF to step in and have conversations with a company like Facebook or an Amazon? on about how they can, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe be better global citizens or maybe make the global situation more fair. And you also talked about um, changes in corporate taxation that could come along with that. I think they come together, you're right. And I also believe that there is an awareness of what's happening. And uh, that would be very welcome mm -hmm. uh, because I believe that all things have to take place in coordination. Uh, you don't just go and, and impose rules without having debated them and consulted and, and, and checked uh, the direct impact and the indirect consequences. But clearly in the area of market power, mm -hmm. you do see, and that's research that will be released in the next few days as well, but you see a group of uh, large dynamic um, companies that do have the benefit of that uh, winner takes most um, that, that you've described. And it's, it's not creating a huge problem for mm -hmm. the moment, but it's heading in that direction. Yeah. So I think we all need to be extremely uh, aware and cautious about it. And we need to frame those policies, look at competition rules, look at barriers to entry, mm -hmm. look at how some of those large companies gobble up uh, little uh, shoots that are trying to uh, also make a name for themselves. All that needs to be, to be addressed so that we do not have uh, those, those mm -hmm. global monopolies that really do not, um, are not conducive to a large share of income going to employees, right. as we have seen. And of course, those companies have fewer employees um, with more output than Correct. you know, a manufacturing company. Now, um, over the weekend, Mark Zuckerberg put out a, an op-ed basically mm -hmm. saying, inviting mm -hmm. regulation. I think it was met with quite a bit of cynicism here in the US, but is that the kind of thing that you think we need to see? We need to see 
global executives coming out and saying, we want to be a part of the process. I mean, does that seem to you like the best solution for um, figuring out how these companies fit into the world? Again, that you know, we're talking about where do we go for the next 75 years? Well, let's hope it is genuine. Uh, mm -hmm. Because as I said, coordination is needed. Cooperation of all actors uh, will be conducive to something that works mm -hmm. rather than something that on paper works and will, will be avoided and schemed mm -hmm. uh, around by the, uh, by the corporate sector. Uh, but I think, you know, truth of the pudding is in the eating. Right. Let's see uh, if, if those companies with that, with that uh, growing market power are genuine mm -hmm. about it. Uh, it's probably because they have a vested interest in setting out the framework within which they can operate mm -hmm. and avoiding um, you know, the negative consequences of somebody else suddenly realizing that they are a problem yeah. and uh, need to be um, addressed yeah. um, without much cooperation. Look, maybe I'm just cynical and I don't think the IMF uh, is going to change and really address climate change or I'm surprised to hear them talk about Facebook's power. Now they come short of saying it's monopoly power, but certainly uh, there are dynamics in the global economy that we hear from a lot of politicians, uh, certainly on the left here in the U.S. and also abroad that the IMF seems at least sympathetic to or that they're exploring. And so outside of the usual, oh, here's how the global economy is going to grow, uh, I think some really interesting comments from Christine Lagarde about where the fund sees its research research and its work going in the coming decades. Uh, great questions. Miles Edlin in DC, we'll check back in with you shortly. that France must actively contribute to the creation of a state crypto money, a stable coin or a crypto euro, which will be issued by the European Central Bank. Johnson's vision on stableton project is that stable coins should be considered as a mean and not an end by itself. What's important is what you will do with this stablecoin. At the very beginning, blockchain was about payment, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer payment. So it made a lot of sense that more and more institu institutional players, both private actors and central banks, are considering blockchain for payments. It will be possible to use those stablecoins uh, for paying uh, your services and your applications on blockchain. The Bank de France is currently preparing a project that will be finalized before the end of the first quarter to carry some experimentations in, with the private sector on the possible use of the blockchain for possible uh, issuance of uh, central bank digital currencies. You don't talk about a uh, euro uh, on a debit card as a stable coin. It's just euro. So uh, we are issuing uh, national currencies on blockchains for businesses. Well, I think the conference was fantastic in many ways. Uh, it's always interesting to meet people and share thoughts and, and listen to uh, how other people think about these issues. Uh, this kind of event is also a good occasion for the global ecosystem to meet each other, know each other better. This conference showed that there are many projects. Things are happening from the regulatory side, from the public institution side, from the project holder side. I think that the very good point of this conference is the diversity of the audience with both people from the public sector, with the French central bank, that we are here to uh, better know about stablecoins. Because of that, it's a very interesting debate between those different uh, profiles. Gentleman with a blue shirt. Yeah. Thank you, Mark Schröers, Börsen Zeitung. My first question is also on the review. Um, <clears throat> you said that it will include an assessment of the instruments used in the past, of the benefits and the risks. Will it also include a discussion about other instruments that could be used in the future, like buying equities, helicopter money, or something like that, all only to be prepared in case it's needed in the future? And the second one is on, on the digital euro and the discussion about central bank digital currencies. Uh, a statement recently to ECOFIN said that the ECB in the future needs to be prepared in case it's needed. Um, how exactly is this work proceeding within the ECB? Mm. And would 
Do you expect a digital euro in the coming years, for example, in the next eight? Um, thank you. For the, uh, for the instruments, I think it is completely legitimate to take stock and to, uh, to assess the effectiveness and the efficiency of the various instruments. Uh, one by one, taken together, and, and what uh, um, leverage they have, they have exercised and what result they have delivered. Uh, as to the future, I think it's going to be for the uh, Governing Council to actually define um, how, as part of the framework, uh, we will be uh, considering those. I see the, very much the strategy as, as a house that we build you know, stone by stone, one after the other, and uh, I think that that's one element that will have to be uh, decided by the Governing Council. On the, uh, on the digital currency, first of all, I, I would like to pay tribute to somebody who is leaving at the end of the year, who has been instrumental um, at the ECB and way beyond uh, to help us understand a bit better and with more clarity the difference between uh, the bitcoins of this world, the stable coins and the digital currency. And that, by that I mean Benoit Curé, who has been a member of the Governing Council, a member of the Executive Board of the ECB and who is finishing at the end of this year. He committed a paper which was um, commissioned, if I recall, by the, the G7, but he also very um, ably uh, participated in a paper that was prepared by the ECB that was distributed by uh, Vice President Guindos at the last ECOFIN, if I recall, which has the benefit in three pages, and I, th I think that's a huge challenge, to you know, draw the line between what we are talking about, uh, between the bitcoins, the stable coins, and the digital currency. And on the latter point, the digital currency, um, we have set up a task force, and we will uh, accelerate the effort of this task force, drawing on the resources of the entire euro system, meaning the national central banks that already participate in that research, uh, that have already committed to the project in terms of, of um, experimentation, uh, pilots here and there. So harnessing on all those experiments that have taken place and all the research that has already put into this effort, together with the work that has been done here also, we will, um, I think we're trying to do that by mid-2020, we will identify, number one, the purpose that we, that we have with that. Are we trying to reduce cost? Are we trying to um, um, cut out the middleman? Uh, are we trying to um, have inclusive finance at, all co at no cost? I mean, there's a whole range of, of uh, objectives that can be pursued. So I think we will start by doing that. Then we will identify the technicalities of it all. Uh, which, is, which is not a given, particularly when you talk about a euro system. And I think that there is also great interest outside um, our regional area. Um, I know, for instance, that uh, Canada, the UK, uh, certainly uh, other countries way beyond are also looking very uh, deeply into that to see if it makes sense, what purpose it serves, and how we can best deliver on it. My personal conviction is that given the de developments we are seeing, not so much in the Bitcoin segment, but in the stablecoins projects, and we only know of one at the moment, but there are others uh, being, being explored and underway at the moment, we'd better be ahead of the curve if that happens, because there is clearly a demand out there that we have to respond to. I would like to add a footnote to that. I think the benefit of the paper is that it also draws a line between this sort of glamorous uh, central bank digital currency, much talked about and worth exploring, and the digital payment systems that we have and that exist. You know, we have several items that are completely digitalized that are not at the, at the front end and that, you know, the, 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 the bank's clients do not perceive as being in operation but where settlement and clearings are actually taking place instantly, thanks to the digital payment system that have been put in place, notably within the Euro system. So on, on those digital Euro system that exist, some of which need a, a better take up by some of the, of the members of the system, uh, I will continue to push because I think we have something which is, which is really worth uh, developing and encouraging. And I'm talking here about TIPS and PEPS and all those acronyms that I should not be using, but I don't know what they stand for. All I know is that they deliver in digital terms the operations of clearing and settling, sometimes in one single operation.
Thank you.